Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My subject in the last lecture of this series is Britain's third string quartet, written in 1975, some 30 years after the second quartet and very near the end of the composer's life. Um, a brief filling in of the time in between will be useful, I think. Now, at the close of my last lecture, we left Britain at a moment of change. Those sweeping C major chords peeling forth at the end of the last movement of his second string quartet were perhaps, in the context of 1945, an expression of triumph, or at least of relief at survival. What's more, Britain himself thought that the quartet marked a new creative direction. In retrospect, though, the immediate future was all about work that had premiered some months before. This was his Suffolk opera, Peter Grimes, which proved so internationally successful that Britain was able to dedicate most of his energy in the following years to opera, to make it, as he said at the time, his real métier. He was aware of the strangeness of this decision. The professional opera composer, the specialist, had long since disappeared from Western music. But as Britain wrote to his fellow comp uh, composer Michael Tippett, I am possibly an anachronism. I am a composer of opera, and that is what I'm going to be throughout." Unquote. Now, for a time, that's exactly what happened. While Britain's early life had seen him dedicate himself to a startling variety of musical genres, the string quartet not least among them, between 1945 and 1954, he was mostly occupied in producing seven operas, two of which, Billy Bard in 1951 and The Turn of the Screw in 1954, almost rivaled Peter Grimes in popularity, both at home and more slowly abroad. But then after the turn of the screw and in what seems again to have been a conscious attempt to renew himself, there came another volte face. Britain turned away from opera and as well as writing more instrumental and chamber music, he essayed other stage genres such as ballets, church parables, children's pieces. His only return to opera during the next 15 years was the Shakespearean adaptation, A Midsummer Night's Dream, in 1960. Then during the 1960s, uh, 60s, as he became a contested and ambiguous national monument, various grandiose operatic projects were mooted, including a King Lear and even an Anna Karenin. Imagine that. Wisely, he left them unrealized. Now, the operas immediately after Grimes tell an interesting story and one that has relevance, I think, to the piece that is my main topic today. His chosen subject matter in these operas continued in the same vein, restraint and ambiguity within personal interior dramas, above all, nothing epic. <clears throat> What's more, Britain showed a continuing willingness to let pure instrumental music take the burden of communication at critical moments. This is heard, for example, in the last minutes of Peter Grimes, when the weary, maddened protagonist takes his boat far out to sea to sink it. Or in Billy Bard, in which the central confrontation in the opera between condemned sailor Billy Bard and his captain, who announces a sentence of death on him, this is represented entirely by means of the orchestra, which moves through a sequence of tonal and orchestral combinations and delicately shifting moods in a succession of 34 chords. Or in the turn of the screw, which, like Grimes, gains much of its individuality from a series of orchestral interludes connecting an otherwise fragmentary succession of short scenes. In other words, although Britain concentrated on vocal genres in this period, the pull of purely instrumental music with its famed absence of precise meaning never deserted him and even proved critical to the articulation of his vocal art. A major shift in these years, however, is that Britain's compositional range became bolder and more eclectic. The interludes in The Turn of the Screw are even variations on a 12-note row, albeit one constructed and then used in a way that maximizes its tonal possibilities. 
Now, Britain's success after Grimes brought with it, as I said, exhortations probably internal as well as external to tackle, if not more heroic subjects, than at least those that might carry a more traditional pedigree. He usually resisted this pressure, but the decision to tackle A Midsummer Night's Dream in 1960 marked a departure of sorts. It was, after all, Shakespeare, and thus with imposing musical precedence. What's more, though, the play presented few opportunities for the characteristic restraint and ambivalence that had fueled his major characters so far. It's clear that Britain was aware of the challenge of the opera. In an essay about Dream, he mentioned that the three layers of action demanded by the topic, those of the lovers, the mechanicals, and the fairies, seemed to him, quote, operatically especially exciting, unquote. There is, though, little doubt that the last of these groups, the fairies, sparked his musical imagination most intensely. The fairies occupy a determinedly non-operatic world. Uh, Oberon is a countertenor, a voice type, until then virtually unknown on the operatic uh, stage. The fairy chorus are trebles, and Puck is an adolescent boy who speaks his lines throughout. Their final salutation at the opera's end, now until the break of day, is a justly celebrated lullaby, complete with poised, antique, Purcellian rhythmic snaps of the type we heard in the finale of the second string quartet, and a narcotic accompaniment of harpsichord and harps revolving endlessly under a melody of extreme, beguiling simplicity. Now, in spite of all this industry and stylistic change, by 1960, the third string quartet was still a long way in the musical future. First, after Dream, there would be further renunciations of opera, and then, in the early 1970s, a cautious return to the stage with Owen Wingrave, an opera written for television, and finally, an adaptation of Thomas Mann's novella, Death in Venice, in 1973, a work that was clearly valedictory and that in the circumstances became inevitably laden with biographical significance. This is the reason. By that time, Britain's health, always fragile, was obviously breaking down. In 1972, it became clear that he required an urgently a heart operation, but he put it off until he had finished Death in Venice in early 1973. Surgery then took place, but it was hardly successful, and and from that time until his death in 1976, he was more or less an invalid, increasingly aware that his days were numbered. It was in these circumstances, uh, post-death in Venice, that the third string quartet emerged. The fact that it is closely tied both in general mood and specific musical detail to his final opera has meant that it too has acquired a large harrowing collection of extra musical baggage. Now this baggage is on one level concerned with the immediate surroundings of the quartet and its genesis. It's dedicated to the musicologist Hans Keller, a prominent voice in early Britain appreciation and a staunch advocate of the Austro-German string quartet canon. But in many ways the true dedicatee is the city that inspired his last opera. Before embarking on Death in Venice, Britain had visited Venice for inspiration, copying down gondolier songs and glorying in the bell sounds of the city. Now, in late 1975, having started the third string quartet in Suffolk, he returned to Venice in what seemed to have been a conscious gesture of farewell. He stayed at the Hotel Danieli, a beautiful old building near the Piazza San Marco, and uncommonly steeped in cultural history of the most august pedigree. Among the Danieli's guests have figured Goethe, Byron, and Dickens. Georges Sand and Alfred de Musset stayed there together. Mendelssohn visited in 1983, sorry, 1830. Good you call that. Debussy in 1880. And in between those two dates, Wagner lodged there several times, at least once in what we might call complex domestic circumstances, together, that is, with his Tristan muse, Matilda Weisendonck, and her long-suffering husband, 
Otto. Now, in case you're interested, modern luminaries have also graced the Daniele's portals. Wikipedia's list of notable guests, guests moves unblushingly from Goethe and Byron to Harrison Ford and Steven Spielberg, which I suppose boasts continuity of a kind. And the hotel's still there, open for business, now a boutique establishment, living off its history to the tune of, on my latest internet search, around 700 euros a night. There's a poignant photo of Britain on his last trip, looking very frail, gazing out from his hotel balcony over the Grand Canal and the inimitable cityscape. Apparently the famous bells were again in evidence. <clears throat> when they were in full peal, his carers threw open the balcony doors of his room to intensify the effect. All this uh, this visit, these sounds, so unlocked Britain's inspiration that he completed the quartet right there in the city. And it was, as it turned out, his last major work. Now, in the circumstances with that gap of 30 years and its accompanying stylistic innovations, it might be thought strange if the third quartet showed much kinship with his other two works in the genre. And there are indeed obvious ways in which Britain's language developed markedly in the interim. In particular, as with the operas, it became spikier and leaner, more prone to an advanced modernist language, both in harmony and texture. But there are nevertheless continuities with the first and second string quartet. One of the most obvious is a remarkable disparity in length between the individual movements. This quartet is in five strongly contrasting movements with the first and the third approximately five minutes each, the second and the fourth much shorter, and the last one obviously exceptional and laden with uncommon resonance going on for around 10 minutes and thus occupying more than a third of the entire work. Thus it's very end weighted, this quartet. Also reminiscent of the first and second quartets is that the quartet medium is, as it were, in a constant state of flux. The famed unity and much vaunted homogeneity of the ensemble is often called into question. Its tendency towards fragmentation is often exploited. Now, nowhere is this more obvious, more programmatic even, than in the first movement, which is aptly called duets. It's laid out, as are all the movements in this quartet, in a broad ABA form. It's a very unusual formal experiment, this, that each of the movements uh, is in the same overall form. You have something stated, there's something contrasted, and then the first idea comes back. Happens in all five movements. So um, <clears throat> this movement, this first movement, explores what Bartok, in a, in, a, in a movement of his concerto for orchestra, famously called a gioco delle coppie, a game of couples. The movement begins with an undulating, constantly intertwining and overlapping duet between the second violin and the viola, a gentle passage that for many has called forth images of the constantly shifting world of Venice's famous waterways, large and small. These two instruments, which play almost as one, are then joined or rather punctuated by mournful, isolated statements from the two outer instruments, injecting either with single, intense, sustained notes, interjecting, sorry, either with single, intense, sustained notes or with echoing pizzicati. Trills and more developed melodic fragments then appear before the undulating theme shifts to the first violin and cello. The B section, the contrasting middle section, is, is very different, rhythmically lively, even assertive, and building to a quasi-orchestral climax with multiple double stopping. But soon those intertwining duets uh, return. The first time they're between two violins, the first violin, very typically for this quartet, first violin straining ever upwards, mournfully airborne. Although the orchestral double stops return briefly, the movement ends, as do so many in this quartet, in fragmentation, seemingly exhausted, echoing with eerie harmonics. 
The second movement, Ostinato, could not be in greater contrast, marked to be played very fast. Its A section contrasts loud, assertive, unison chords, exploring the entire range of the quartet in four heavy crotchets. It alternates that with a busy theme, first introduced on the first violin and sounding for all the world like a fugal subject. It's a very typical fast Britain inspiration. The B section is contrasting again in dynamics and texture. It returns us closer to the mood of the first movement. Now the outer sections of the third movement called solo are the bleakest of the entire work and that's saying something. They are dominated by the first violin playing near the extreme of its upper range like a voice crying in the wilderness. The music's spare beauty is uncannily reminiscent of Shostakovich and could well be Britain's homage to his fellow artist who had died in August of that very year. Equally extraordinary though is the central section in which the first violin mutates into trilling bird song and the lower strings join in to create a bizarre dawn chorus, each with individual repetitive figures, the second violin and viola with arpeggios and the cello sliding in and away from harmonics. <clears throat> the fourth movement is characterized like the second with abrupt energy, it's also very fast. Occasional use of harmonics, panoply of accents, an unusual stratified sound world in the B section, in which, among other advanced techniques, the viola is instructed to play on the wrong side of the bridge like a child let loose. All this seems to be offering a kind of showcase of avant-garde string techniques. It's over in a flash, this movement, a self-conscious miniature, which in retrospect is plainly just preparing us for the final movement. Now that last movement, as I said, is in many ways uh, the most important in the work as well as its goal. Its title is Recitative and Passacaglia La Serenissima, and it makes an, here an unequivocal reference to Venice and to the city hymned as La Serenissima by a chorus in Act One of Death in Venice. More important, though, its recitative-like opening is made up of five quotations, some more obvious than others, from the opera. Now, there's no need here to itemize all those references, but the first played solo on the cello is, I think, unmistakable in the way its gently rocking motion offers a renewed evocation of that Venetian ambience. Most occluded and difficult to grasp is the last quotation, which, through delicate motivic shadowing, presents a version of the poignant end of Death in Venice's first act, in which the protagonist, aging novelist Gustav von Aschenbach, finally admits to himself and sings out, molto rallentando, then very slow, then almost spoken, sings out his love for an impossible object, a vision of the youth he can never recapture. It hardly needs saying that these shadowy quotations make new sense, perhaps even final sense, of Britain's operatic tendency that I mentioned earlier to dissolve into purely instrumental ambiguity at critical moments. This last movement of this last quartet, in other words, does nothing less than transform itself into a continuation of, or perhaps a retrospective commentary on, the composer's last opera. Such sentiments only become more intense in what follows after that opening recitative of the last movement. What the quartet ends with is a closing passacaglia in which over the slowly oscillating tread of a cello ground bass, the upper three instruments one by one offer melodic counterpoint. There's so much to say about this ending. The cello's ground bass, solemn crotchets very low in the register of the instrument, is clearly a gesture to those bell sounds that Britain heard from his room in the Hotel Daniele. The upper lines in their tonality of E major, in their constant syncopations and melodic contour, seem in one sense to offer a ghostly echo of the fairy chorus I mentioned earlier 
that closes a Midsummer Night's Dream. There, strumming harps and descanting trebles summon forth magical but benign nighttime activity. Trip away, make no stay, meet me all by break of day. Here, though, the mood is darker, much darker. Above all, there's no expectation of light to break the spell. The upper parts never quite manage to take flight, never fully embrace their own fragile lyricism. They seem constantly in danger of losing identity, of giving in, of being drawn into the weighty, fatal pull of the bell-like cello. Uh, they seem in danger of themselves becoming mere toiling oscillation. What's more, the melodic content, contour of both the bass and the upper part, their reiteration of the first three notes of the E major scale, is surely yet another coded reference to Aschenbach's confession of love at the end of Act One of Death in Venice, which is articulated via those same three notes. Read in this way, this passacaglia is, if you will, a patient, doleful composing out of that all too human confusion of passion, mingles as it is with a poignant awareness of the subjunctive and the finite of a love that's all consuming, that must remain hidden, and that will ultimately rest buried beneath the constant, everlasting bells of a beautiful, decaying city. Almost inevitably in the circumstance, the Passacaglia ends not with solemn closure, but as did the first and third movements with fragmentation and a final question. The cello's tolling comes to an end on a long held low note. The upper instruments drop out to leave the cello there alone. The score's final instruction is dying away. Now, how is one to perform such a movement, such a, a work? Despite a number of free elements, in particular in the third movement's dawn chorus section, the score of this third string quartet is uncommonly detailed in bowing instructions, in dynamic instructions, in expressive marks for the players. Britain seemed to leave remarkably lit little to the discretion of the performers. And then if to demonstrate this further, he jotted down precise timings, timings accurate to the second for each movement of the quartet. What's more, we have ample evidence that the composer became increasingly intolerant of performers who strayed from what he considered the exact letter of the text. The vocal score of Death in Venice, for example, contains the following rather threatening instruction, quote, the opera has been recorded complete on Decca under the supervision of the composer. It is recommended that all those involved in a production of the opera should acquaint themselves with this recording, unquote. He loved that passive uh, voice there. And when passive aggressive, it is recommended that. And when in 1975 Britain heard the Canadian tenor John Vickers take the protagonist role in Peter Grimes at Covent Garden and perform it in a vocal manner whose robustness was many leagues away from the then standard interpretation of Peter Pears, he was incensed commenting, quote, why does this man, why does this man not observe what I wanted, unquote. Now, in these circumstances, should performers of the string quartet simply attempt to reproduce as accurately as possible the creator's every wish, perhaps modeling themselves slavishly on the recording of the Amadeus Quartet, who were its first interpreters and who worked extensively with the composer? This question is not made easier by the relative nearness of the work to our own time, still less by the fact that its message was plainly so personal to Britain himself. But whatever one's views, individual decisions will rarely be straightforward about these matters. What, after all, um, uh, will rarely be straightforward. What, after all, is the performer's ultimate responsibility? Is it to the absent composer and his work, or is it to the present audience 
and thus to a patiently acquired sense of how the piece will best communicate now, at this moment in history. Now, most would say that, of course, performers should respect both, but sometimes, indeed, very often, crossroads will be reached, moments requiring choices that may have delicate but nevertheless profound effects on the music. This is, after all, a work that gestures again and again towards some of life's great mysteries, its most humbling challenges. Steps towards understanding it should, perhaps above all, be wandering and slow, ever aware of the subjunctive and the finite. Well, here to play Britain's third quartet for you today is the Badka String Quartet. Please join me in welcoming them. Charlotte Scott, first violin, Emma Parker, second violin, John Thorne, viola, and Jonathan Byers, cello. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we play uh, Britain's last major work, uh, we were incredibly saddened uh, to hear of the death of Hugh Maguire um, a little under two weeks ago. Uh, Hugh Maguire was uh, one of life's gems. Uh, he, was, he led the London Symphony Orchestra, the BBC Symphony Orchestra, the Allegri Quartet, amongst many, many other groups. Um, he was one of the most inspirational uh, teachers uh, that ever existed, I think. Um, and we were incredibly fortunate to uh, study with him um, at Alborough over the years. Um, uh, and in fact, we, we played Britain's third quartet to him only a year and a half ago in his living room. Uh, so we would very much like to dedicate this performance uh, to the memory of, of Hugh Maguire.
Let's see if anyone's got any questions that they'd like to ask the quartet uh, at this point. Um, I was wondering whether, I mean, uh, uh, you know, one of the things about this quartet is that there are many recordings of it out there which have a lot of sort of pretension to authenticity. I mean, there's the Amadeus Quartet. You were talking about the Allegri. How do you deal with that? I mean, what, what, what is your attitude to those, to those precedents? Um, well, we, um, we, we do actually listen to um, a lot, if, if not perhaps all, um, almost of the recordings. Certainly I do, maybe not, not all of us, but... Um, <clears throat> and as you said, the Amadeus uh, version is is one that you really have to sit up and take notice of because you know that uh, Britain was was present and, and worked on it with them despite sadly not being able to be there for the premiere of the um, uh, of, of the performance. Um, so yeah, I mean, we take a lot of inspiration from that. Um, it was interesting you mentioning about how Britain became so strict with his, uh, in terms of you know wanting people to obey his markings um, so solidly, um, and that's that's really you know as, aside from listening, you don't really go in listening to recording in the hope to copy something. Of course, you like things and you dislike things, but really it's all there in the text. As, as you said, he marks so many different details for the performer, um, and really as long as you do all that, then inevitably every performance is going to be different and that's the joy of it. That's the whole point. So yeah, it's yeah. We're certainly not trying to emulate the Amadeus um, even though that wouldn't be a bad thing, I'm sure. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's just about what sort of room there is for interpretation, really. I mean, that's... Uh, I think uh, often, actually, you find that um, the closer you are to the score, the better it works. So often, when you first start doing something, you uh, start playing something, your own feeling comes into it and... Uh, you feel like it's not working, and then when you actually just go back to what's in the score, then it does actually just work. Um, so it's worth at least starting from what's in the score. Especially when it's a composer who is as good as Britain. Yeah, exactly. Uh, anyone got any questions they're burning to ask? Yes, there's one at the front. Just speak up and we'll translate it. Yeah, okay, so the question is, um, uh, were they um, aware of the continuity or discontinuity between this quartet and the, and the first ones? Uh, I think one of the great things about doing this project is for us to work through the composer right from a, quite a young age right to the end of his life. And one of the remarkable things about Britain is Britain's skills as a sculpture of, mu of music is unbelievable all the way through his life. And, of course, you can feel the youthful spirit in number one especially, and a growing maturity in number two, and, and in this one, as, as Keller, as we know, said, you know, he, he writes his own passing. And so I think we noticed that the techniques are very similar, the approach is very similar, but the, the feeling of the man is very clearly different through the, each quartet. Okay, well, look, we'll, we'll let them go again. Another round of applause, and thank you very much all for joining us.